This week, we explore why it's taking three hours longer to fly to China and how we can help you put a moat around your business. Welcome to the Profit Cash Growth Podcast. This is the podcast for six and seven figure business owners who are looking to grow a financially successful business. My co-host, Claire Hancock, is a finance director, chartered accountant, and entrepreneur. And every week, I'll be exploring guidance and frameworks designed to help you increase your profits, improve your cash flow, and grow your business. So this week, Claire, we're going to talk about the hours journey we've just had back and the vomit-inducing trip of our (laughs) British roads, aren't we? Yes. Yes. Why is that? Because we've had a little trip away, only driven an hour, only only driven an hour away. To be fair, we were supposed to go on a fairly main road, but it was shut and we ended up literally on like little country lanes and they were in such a state. The journey for the whole hour was just treacherous, wasn't it? I mean, I drove there. And it, I had to drive very slow. It was just terrible. But I was the passenger back and I've just had breakfast and I feel like I've just got back and I just feel like I'm going to throw up any minute. It's just like, what is going on? It's like every road, like every road for a whole hour is just, it's just knackered, isn't it? It's interesting because I grew up like really in the sticks. I grew up in like Norfolk in my teens and when I first started driving and I remember driving down country roads hurtling in my little Corsa with like my subwoofer in the back thinking I was like the dog's bollocks when I was 17 and I don't remember ever driving like with my eyes out for potholes no no like so I do, scared it's yeah. like like when we drive in like places like Mauritius where you've got you've got to drive 10 miles an hour and watch out for cows coming out towards you and potholes here there and everywhere it's terrible I said to you didn't I that this just like it feels I can't remember a time in history where it just you know, it feels like our country's just had a really Knackered. bad 10 or 15 years, like really bad. Like, I can't imagine a time when it's worse than this. But anyway, enough about the whinging about the, the state of the roads and things like that. Let's move on to this week's news story of the week. So this week, the news story is that British Airways are no longer flying to one of the largest economies in the world and one of the main cities, which is Beijing. And the reason I picked this story is there is a business angle to the back of this story, which I think actually is a little bit shocking in some ways when you you sort of understand the reasons for this. And it's all to do with our sanctions on Russia and not flying through Russian airspace. You've looked a little bit more into this, haven't you, Claire? Yeah. So this absolutely blew my mind when you told me that basically BA are no longer flying to China. They used to fly over Russian airspace. And now, obviously, because of the sanctions on Russia, Russia responded and closed its airspace to most, well, all European countries, basically. So the UK and other European countries aren't allowed to fly over Russian airspace, which means they need to take a two hour diversion. Three hours, I think, isn't it? Three hours. I, ten, 10 hours to 13 hours is now the British Airways trip to Beijing. Yeah. So not only do people not want to take a BA flight because it's two to three hours longer, but also the cost of, you know, BA of actually having to like fly the aircraft for longer. So they've got extra fuel costs, extra staff costs, et cetera, et cetera, and like reschedule all the routes so that, you know, because generally the planes are just flying backwards and forwards, aren't they? So yeah. the, the cost has just ended up prohibitive to BA and customers don't want it either. So people aren't booking onto it. So they're just not flying there anymore. And it's not only BA, other airlines are doing it as well. I was yeah. just reading when we were doing a bit of a research for this, that Virgin are not going to be doing it after after their summer 24 leg either. And this is where it takes a dark turn and gets absolutely nuts because obviously BA have quite rightly as a business run the numbers and they've said, look, with the additional fuel burn for those three extra hours, plus the fact that customers are put off now having to travel 13 hours over 10 over some competitors that can still, and this is the bit, can still can or still. choose to still fly over Russian airspace. Like Chinese at, airlines. At, well, just spoil my thunder, why don't you? So the... The main point of this story for me is that basically having run all those maths, BA have decided to pull out, but because BA are part of the One World Alliance and still need to be able to offer their customers the route into China, they are now effectively pushing all their customers to China Airways, which Mm -hmm. is their code share partner. So they're effectively giving British business and British profits to China Airlines because 
China, who are quite happy to be in bed with Russia and fly over Russian airspace, now can do it in a more competitive environment. So the only people that have been hurt from the sanctions of not flying over the Russian airspace is the UK itself. And it's really interesting because if you went on the BA website, you could still book the flight via the BA website. Yeah, it just literally comes up with a little note next to it and it says, you know, will be serviced by China Airlines. That's all it says. So it's, yeah, it's bonkers that so, because that that route is such a huge money pit Mm -hmm. and there's so many, like literally like millions of people are flying this route every year and all that money is now going into China's economy and not the UK. And it's just absolutely bonkers. And it got us thinking about maybe how many other negative impacts there are from, you know, the Russian sanctions sanctions where it's don't get me wrong. It's absolutely the right thing to do to sanction Russia. But there is an element of are we cutting off our nose despite our face in some cases? The real people that are hurting here, if our own national carrier, privately owned business, lots of our pensions, Mm -hmm. you know, involved in that are literally, you know, farming the business and just giving it to Chinese growth. It's really interesting because when... Russia originally said, screw you, you're not flying over our airspace. There was calls from quite a lot of European airlines, including BA, to say, you know, actually, if a plane flies over Russian airspace, it should not be allowed to land in Europe. Mm. And therefore, everybody would be on the same on on the same footing. So, you know, these Chinese airlines wouldn't be able to fly over Russian airspace and land in the UK. They would have to take a diversion, which means BA and China would be in the same situation and therefore could still compete. Yeah. So yeah, it's really it's really interesting and just all of these hidden impacts when you that don't you just don't, you don't understand even realize that. and this, those hidden business challenges that are there. You know that is yeah you know, quite quite rightly for BA. It's it's the right and only business decision mm. they can make. But actually, you know that's once again you know government level decisions that are tying the hands of business owners behind their back and and actually forcing you know forcing an unwanted consequence out the other side really yeah absolutely there's there's, you know there's always an equal upside and downside to every choice that you make isn't there it's like the butterfly effect like you'll do something and then then the next thing will happen the consequences just snowball and before you know it you've got this big problem that nobody intended in the first place Great. So well, yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's 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 a fascinating one. I always like to pick out these stories where there's just a you know there's a business tale behind it that's really really fascinating that most people wouldn't have thought of. So anyway, let's move on, Claire, to this week's deep dive. So this week, Claire, you're going to talk to me about Michael Porter's barrier to entry. Now, this is a framework or a concept, isn't it? Do you mm-hmm. want to explain to me the the concept? I, I've never heard of it in this way before, but I do know of the concept. It's talked about a lot. Yeah, so the concept, other people might say something along the lines of like, put put a moat around your business or protect your business. And this is where it stems from is this guy called Michael Porter, who was Mm a um, famous business strategist at the Harvest Business School in the 70s. And he came up with this concept about why certain industries are competitive and and why they're not. And, And barriers to entry is really like a key element of the competitive environment that that any business is operating in. But when we apply this concept to small businesses, we're able to make small businesses more profitable and ultimately more saleable. So I've obviously heard the saying, put a moat around your business mm. a lot. But for anybody that hasn't, what does that? What do you mean by put a moat around your business? Yeah. So what we're saying is we want your business to be more difficult for people, other people to compete with. Okay. So if you think about like any business when it gets started. So let's think about, I don't know, we saw this in COVID, loads of people started like baking stuff in their own homes and selling them, take brownies as an example. There is absolutely nothing stopping me going into the kitchen right now, baking some brownies and going and walking down the street, knocking on people's doors and selling brownies and I'd have a brownie business, right? Sure. But if you then think about, okay, what's the next step in business and how do we how do we make ourselves bigger and better? Because if I can do it that easily... Anybody can do it that easily. There's no barrier to entering into the brownie sales yeah. industry. This is a bit like yeah? hairdressing, for example. Another exactly. One. Anyone can yeah. you know, pick up a pair, do some hairdressing business from home or various other yeah. things. Because now, especially with the barriers of like, you know, now you don't even need this, uh, the salon and various other things. People are quite happy to go to people's homes and do this type of stuff. You know, I guess nail bar and things like that. Th- those type of industries yeah. are just tomorrow I can just start trading in them. And there's so many businesses that are like that, you know, particularly service-based industries. That's another really great example. So if we take the brownie brownie industry, so I've gone into my kitchen, I've made some brownies, but and I've been really busy and everybody wants my brownies, but now I'm like at the point where I can't I, I can't physically 
make any more brownies so I'm not able to grow my business. So the next step is then to purchase some machinery yeah. or to get a commercial kitchen. And if I'm going to do postal brownies so that I can distribute all around the UK, then all of a sudden I need a distribution network. And we start to layer on all these complexities, which make it far more difficult for other people to compete with me because I've now got competitive advantages. I can distribute to the whole of the UK. I've got commercial machinery, so my price point is lower. Yeah. So all of a sudden, it's actually becoming more difficult for these people that are baking at home to compete with my business. So that's why as we grow our businesses and as our businesses get older and more established, we need to think about putting these barriers to entry in place that give us gives us a competitive advantage over other people in our marketplace that are competing with us. So in your example that you've given there in your scalability of your brownie business, what's the moat that's starting to build up? Is that a lower price point because you can produce higher, therefore mm. you can produce cheaper, so therefore you can undercut uh, the, the one-man bands. or is there are other elements to that? I think the biggest element there would be the machinery. So when you're thinking about barriers to entry, the one of the barriers, there's maybe like five key key things where you would have an advantage over somebody else. So if we take the obvious one, I want to buy machinery, well, I need money to do that. Yeah. So to buy commercial machinery, you know, for a commercial kitchen to deck out a commercial kitchen, you're probably going to be looking at 20 grand. Mm. So that wipes out so many people already because they just don't have that capital outlay to compete with me. So if you can get yourself yeah. in that position where you've got that got that capital to spend, you're ahead of, you know, probably 90% of other people in the first place. Yeah. So you've got a competitive edge that way. Or if you think about once I've got my machinery, I'm then purchasing so much more so I can start to get discounts from my suppliers. So my price point goes down, which means maybe I can also bring my selling point down. Other people then can't compete on price with me. Yeah. So there's lots of ways you can do it. So the first one is capital outlay. We've got cost savings or some sort of price efficiency. But there's also other ways that you can do this as well. So if you think about a really good way is to have something to do with some sort of governmental or regulation that protects your business. Yeah, yeah. I've heard about it. things like, I don't know, like the reason that schools or childcare or things like that with Ofsted, mm. that's that's very challenging because you've got to meet certain standards or various ombudsmans, you know, like, you know, I'm I'm part of a, the property ombudsman. You've got to be part of a an ombudsman in that particular sense. Yeah. So things like that make it a bit more challenging, don't they? Certainly yeah, it's like the difference to... between a babysitter yeah. getting paid, you know, yeah. basically minimum wage and a sure. nursery yeah. or a childminder. You pay far more for a childminder than you do for a mm. babysitter. It's mm. that type of thing because the, the childminder or the nursery has got all this regulation around it that's protecting it. Yeah. And for somebody to enter into that market, they've got to understand the regulation and be able to comply with it. And that comes with knowledge, skill set and and cost ultimately. Yes, you see this especially in the financial world because that's highly regulated. So really challenging. You can't even talk about or do anything in the financial world until you're, you know, FCA or what, whatever they, they call it. So if you're mortgage brokers and various other things, so they're quite key, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great example. And then another competitive advantage would be, you know, do you have access to a market that other people don't have? So if you've got customers and i think this is one key thing that small businesses often overlook and probably not very good at this is collecting details about their customers once you build up that customer base because if you think there's only two ways really yeah. to get a customer base you've got to buy it and you can buy a list of people or you can market to people you know google ads things like that collect email addresses collect contact details yeah. or you've got to earn it you've got to earn it over all those years of building up your customer base and so there's only two ways you can get customers so if you've got that customer list you've mm. already got such a competitive advantage over other people that prevents a them from competing with you access to a certain market and actually yeah. taking this back to our news story this week that's something that china airlines currently have that british airways don't which is access to that market for that route because mm. they're flying o over Russia. So therefore, all of a sudden, they've got a, a moat around their particular part of their business on that particular route. Yeah, absolutely. So you've got to just really think about how can I make it more difficult for somebody to compete with me? Because when we all start in business, we need it to be super simple and we need it to be easy and cheap. So we all start with very low barriers to entry. And, you know, that actually makes good sense because you don't want to go investing loads of time and energy and, and money into something whether you're not quite mm. sure if it's going to work long term. So it absolutely makes sense to do it the simplest, cheapest, quickest way at the start. But if you're starting you're, from scratch, I guess the other if you're aspect a brand new of this business is, person. Is, is this a, 
a really or is this a stronger argument for acquisition again because you're buying the moat that's already around that in a way rather than like you say it's very difficult to start a business from scratch and build the moat from the off isn't it oh 100 percent. and i think this is something that when people are looking at doing acquisitions and they're talking about buying a business is this is one of the things that i'll always be challenging them on i'll be like what are you buying over and above just sales growth yeah. because a lot of the time yes you can get this overnight sales growth but honestly a lot of the time i think you could just plow a lot of money into advertising and get that sales growth in a much easier way so yeah if, if a business wants to grow then you're really going to be looking to purchase another business that has got high barriers to entry because if a business has got high barriers to entry it's more valuable yeah and that would be a reason to buy it and a classic one is buying businesses that have employees that have a skill set or a knowledge or something that you don't have already yes yeah you you, you've all you also talked a bit about did you mention about data earlier because I think data is another one, isn't it? Another mode. Yeah, access you know, I was, to I'm, customers. I'm just like, in my head, I'm trying to think about like, obviously some of the businesses that get highly criticised for not having a motor. And I remember years ago, the old, you know, Amazon sellers, everyone was an Amazon seller and it was dead easy. Mm-hmm. And until Amazon cr- smell what sell and then start to manufacture that and then yeah. you've lost your business overnight. And also, you know, you put it through Amazon or eBay and you don't have the customer base. So the best businesses are those that make sure that they try and farm and obtain the direct deed to that customer and then market back to them so that over time, they're building this list of people that will buy from them again and again and again and they can talk to them market to them text them email them all those kind of things and i guess you know if you came to me as a business and said look here's ten thousand people i've got their emails i've got their mobile phone numbers and they've transacted with this versus i don't know the name of anybody that's a massive moat isn't it from a you know a cost effective way to do it rather than big capital expenditures yeah and i think if you think about a lot of the schemes that people sell online you know like these get rich quick businesses and these like businesses in a box models and things like that you know like coaching drop shipping all of these yes, types of things yeah. they're so easy to do because they've got no barriers to entry yeah. they don't require any money to get started and they don't yeah. require any skill set there's no regulation to compete with they don't require you to buy any assets to do it they are literally out the box you just need to get on a laptop mm. and you and you can make money it's an annoying it's an annoying conundrum though isn't it because people want the quickest way to start to get some cash in their pocket because often they've left a job or they you know they've got expenditure there that they need that runway to be fairly quick and the low barriers to entry businesses are generally the ones where you're going to earn cash quicker the yeah. runway's not as far whereas when you're building a business that it's got that moat around it actually you probably have to forgo salary and 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 cash for quite a long period as you've got a longer run up to that so actually it's that thing of the longer run up the bigger the reward because you've got you know you're building a more protected business all round aren't you and i think that when a business owner's got a concept of this sort of barrier to entry that's okay to start you know mm. it, absolutely starting as a drop shipping business you know that gets that's the wheel moving that's, vi- then, that's yeah. a viable business like you said it gets the wheel moving and then you think okay so what's the next stage to drop shipping okay well we need to stop drop shipping we need to start shipping container loads into the country and we need a warehouse yeah. and then we need a distribution unit so you can start start simple start with low capital outlay start with low regulation start with low skill set but then build up those complexities as you start to learn your marketplace and you start to understand okay where's my skill set you know what what is it that makes our business work what is it that we're really good at yeah. then you start to build a moat around that yep. so if if you're a business that's fantastic at sales then you want to start thinking okay how do we capitalize that and how do we protect that mm. if you're a business that's fantastic at operations it's okay how do we put a moat around that and how do we capitalize that i guess contract contracts is another thing that you know is a big moat isn't it if you're a a b2b business and you can have people paying you on a monthly basis under contract Mm. that 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 makes that quite desirable doesn't it it's the same thing that makes a business valuable versus also putting that moat around it because you've you've got those customers under some sort of agreement they can't just come and go when they want and i think that that's crucial as well is a lot of businesses are quite transactional and there's no there's no reason or no commitment for the customer to keep coming back and that yep. also is another method of putting a barrier around your business. If you can tie your customers in, and if you can tie your customers in because there's limited other options for them to go yeah. somewhere else, then, you know, if you think about if you're a household and you want a cleaner, clean as a ten a penny. But if you're a business and you've got a high glass wall and you need somebody to put on a harness and have some special cherry picker equipment to go and do it, you know, there's far fewer 
people that you can pick up the phone to and say, can you give me a quote for coming to do this? Yeah. And that's why if if as a commercial cleaner with that equipment, you win that business, you're so much likely to keep it for longer because there's just far fewer people competing with you. So it makes it much more difficult for your customer to change, even if they weren't happy with you or they weren't happy with your price or something like that. Amazing. So that is Michael Porter's barrier to entry concept. Yeah, it's part of a, a wider framework. Michael, Porter, Michael Porter's five forces. Okay, barriers to entry Google is one Google of that. them. Yeah, Brilliant. so I'll probably do a few YouTube videos on like the the individual elements. But yeah, it's all about why industries, why the competitive landscape looks the way it is, and where yeah. the power sits. You know, is it with the customers, the suppliers, etc., or your Perfect. business? And ultimately, you want as much power as possible to sit with your business over your customers, over your suppliers, and over your competitors. And again, it's about the business owner having the time to actually think about that and actually yeah. go and actually just recognise it and say, I do need to be thinking about you know where my power lies with my business against mm. the market forces and the competitors there around them. So amazing. Thanks, Claire. And you said you've also got a YouTube video on this one as well. Yeah, I did yep. a YouTube video on this last, last week weeks. as well. So Brilliant. yeah, we'll put so that in the show notes. Go and check that out on the Profit Cash Growth YouTube channel. Brill, let's move on to this week's Profit Cash Growth Extra then. I'm so excited about this one. I'm usually so excited about every one of it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but this do. is like... You just stumble across these things, and I love it. It's a it's a podcast rec- recommendation this week. Now, I'd like to say they're they're more like audio books than they are a podcast because they're so goddamn long. I mean, some of the episodes are three, four, or even five hours long. Yeah, this is not a podcast, but this is the Acquired Podcast. It's been going for a long time. It's two uh, American presenters, and basically they they tell the story of business and key brands and businesses Mm -hmm. and their journey and their stories very biographical in 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 a sense i love reading business biographies and i mean one of my favorites should be a profit cash growth as well is the the book shoe dog the story of nike but they cover that again and it's quite nice because it's two two guys that are kind of they're discussing the journey you know as they as they tell you the story of it and i just want to pick out a couple of episodes that i just absolutely loved them I've only done about four or five so far. There's so much content to go at. But um, the first one I picked, which it just blew my mind, was all about Nintendo. Mm. And it was just absolutely, absolutely amazing just to hear the whole journey of Nintendo. They are one of the most up and down businesses ever. They've been at the peak. They've been at the trough. They've been nearly knocked out. And it's so exciting to read all the strategies and the mistakes that they made and some of the business decisions they made. So you've listened to a few as well, haven't you, Claire? Yeah, Sony. I Oh, Sony, yeah. Amazing. I found Sony fascinating because I just, I didn't quite realise the, the time that Sony came was like just after the Second World War. And I, I found it baffling yeah. that so much of Sony's success was dependent on America. And bearing in mind, like, America had just yeah dropped an atomic yeah. bomb on Japan, Amazing. and yet somehow they worked together. And yeah, I, I just found that all like from a sort of social political aspect very mind boggling how successful Sony has been thanks to America just after America bombed Japan. So it's quite yeah. interesting. And we listen to Starbucks, Starbucks as well. Starbucks one that good one. Just in the Great, off, isn't it? That, yeah. Again, everything one so far has been. Really, and that's actually really from very good. the founder, the CEO of Starbucks, is actually, um, is actually on, on, their, on that podcast yeah, telling the story firsthand the, yeah. as well, which is fascinating to hear. So, yeah, they are long, but there are natural intervals as amazing, well. As well. So Just, we, we tend to break them down, do them in sort of like half hour, 45 minute stints. If you can put them on a long drive, then that that's where they really work well. I mean, I went to Leicester and back recently and that is three hour round trip. And yeah, I covered off Nintendo and it was, yeah, it was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. So yeah, check it out. Acquired the Acquired podcast. You can find it on all of the usual podcast places. But yeah, you, you're going to lose some hours of your life once you get del- delving into that. But there's so much to go. At. You'll be at it for years. So, well, thanks for joining us for another uh, podcast. As always, if uh, you feel like you might have outgrown your accountant and uh, you'd like to work with Claire and the team at Profit Cash Growth, please just drop us a note. Go up to the website profitcashgrowth.com. Check her out on the YouTube channel for more free content. And as always, we will see you again next week. But don't forget to rate, review and subscribe us if you like us.